Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon text for today is our Old Testament lesson from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7, which we now hear again. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. We are a creedal church. What this means is that as members of this church, either individually or as a group, we do not invent our own understanding of the Christian faith. Instead, we confess what we believe about God and the condition of the world and even ourselves according to the creeds of the church. And these creeds are not new. We usually confess our faith in the divine service according to either the Apostles or Nicene Creed, creeds according to which Christians have been confessing their faith since about the year 400 and 325, respectively. But even though we are a creedal church, that does not mean we are not a biblical church. The two are not in conflict. We are a creedal church because we are a biblical church. The creeds according to which we confess our faith are themselves entirely drawn from Scripture. If you go through the creeds down line by line, there are scriptural proofs for every single thing which we confess about God and the world. So don't ever think that Christians or churches which claim to be based only on the Bible, but not on creeds, somehow have it better than we do. As members of a creedal church, all of our beliefs are based on the Bible too. But by confessing our biblical Christian faith according to the historic creeds of the church, along with confessing the doctrinal substance of our faith, we are also confessing the timelessness and even the transcendence of our faith. And this is important because Christianity is much bigger than just us right here, right now. The creeds which we usually use in the divine service are old. But neither of them is the oldest, not by a long shot. The oldest creed, the original one, if you will, is in fact contained in the words of our Old Testament lesson for today. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now even though this creed is probably not as long as the ones we are used to confessing, it is still a creed because it is still an explanation of our faith in God. And obviously it is based on the Bible because it is in the Bible. So what is God telling us in these verses? Why is it important for us to learn the history and the creeds of God's church? When the words of our text were originally spoken to the people of Israel, there were only three people alive among the people who had actually experienced for themselves God's intervention in taking his people out from slavery in Egypt. But this was not the way things had to have been. God wanted to bring his people into the promised land, essentially, right away after taking them out from Egypt. But the people had not been willing to go. When the people had come to the border of the promised land for the first time, men were sent in to scout the land. But when they came back, they reported to the people there was no way that the land could be taken. That is, except for the scouts Joshua and Caleb. All the people should have had fresh in their mind the memory of God's power in overcoming which, what, Egypt, which was one of the most militarily powerful nations on earth in that time. They had seen with their own two eyes the plagues, and, they had, when their, and with their own two feet they had walked on the seabed of the Red Sea as God opened it up for his people, only to then bring it crashing back down on the army of Pharaoh, destroying it. But having seen these great wonders from God, the people still wavered in their faith. They didn't think they could take the land, which means they didn't think that God could take the land. So, seeing the people's unwillingness to trust him, God turned his people back around and had them wander around in the wilderness of Sinai until every single adult in that party 
had died. What this meant is that by the time they again came to the border of Canaan, save for Moses and then also Joshua and Caleb who had trusted, everyone in the nation of Israel had either been a child or hadn't even been born yet when God delivered them out from slavery in Egypt. Because of this, the fact that they either didn't remember or had never seen for themselves all these events from God, they needed to be told about them. And this was for much more than their merely understanding that God had done these things in the past. All these people who were now alive, what hadn't been back then, needed to understand that God had done these things for them. And that they were the people of the promise. And that God had woven them into this great story, which he was now telling through their lives. This is really the same reason why we need to teach our young people about what God has done, not only for other people, but also for them. It may be true that neither the children here nor any of us were present for such things as the parting of the Red Sea, or the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, or the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But our not being there doesn't mean that these events don't matter to us, or that we are not part of God's story. We are part of it, because God made us part of it when he washed away our sins and gave us faith in holy baptism. It is from this, and then from continuing to hear God speak to us through his word for our whole lives, that we learn the story of sin and grace is not someone else's story, but it is also our story. When Adam and Eve first sinned, we learned that it was not just their problem, but it's also our problem, a problem into which, unfortunately, we fall every day of our lives. And then when God promised Adam and Eve that he would send the Messiah, and then when he repeated this promise to Abraham and every other time in the Old Testament, God was not just saying this to other people. He was also saying this to us. And finally, when God had kept this promise in the incarnation and birth of Jesus Christ, and when Jesus was hanging on the cross and said to the repentant thief, today you will be with me in paradise, he was also saying this to us telling us that he had indeed paid for our sins and that through faith in Jesus, we are made to be at one with God. This is why Christian education is so entirely important. It is not the kind of book learning that you get in school, which will hopefully serve you well in this life for as long as you are alive on the earth. To be educated in God's truths really is an education which lasts beyond a lifetime because the substance of the Christian faith is the divinely given knowledge and faith through which God not only forgives us of our sins, but also carries us through life until he brings us to be with him in heaven. We need this. Our children need this. God's people back in the time of Moses needed this. And through his word, God gives this faith to us. Now when we see everything that God has done for us and for his people in the past, we are reminded that we do not blindly believe in a God who is all talk but no substance. This is why Moses assembled the people and spoke the words of our text to them. The land into which they were about to go was the land that God had promised to give to them. But in many ways, it was still a new and dangerous world, one in which they were going to find many physical and spiritual dangers. And God wanted his people to be able to withstand all of these, which was why Moses preached to them about God's commands and promises and actions. This word was the means through which God strengthened the faith of his people before they set out to take what God had promised to give to them. Now, in what way was the world back then any different than the world in which we live today? In things having to do with the way of life and technology and whatnot, the world today is much different than it was over 3,000 years ago. But the condition of the world and the human condition is 100% the same. We all have inside of us two related temptations that all the people back then had too. These are either to completely ignore God and his word or to view God and his word as we would view a buffet taking what seems good to us, but ignoring and not taking any of the stuff that doesn't seem as good. It should be obvious that it is self-destructive to completely ignore God and his word, 
because to do that separates you from the love of God in Christ and the forgiveness of your sins. But it can be just as destructive to create or try to create your own understanding of Christianity by trying to blend the unchanging truths of God's word with the constantly changing moods of society. God does not change, and neither do any of the truths or principles which he gives to us in his word. But the world does change, and it tries to pressure us to change along with it. And in some ways we do change with the world, because Christianity is not a religion which demands a certain era or culture in which its adherents can thrive. Instead, this one true religion is one which is needed for and is suitable for people from all times and places. But when it comes to what God tells us is true about law and gospel and sin and grace, the Christian church and Christians need to be unwavering because there is such a thing as truth. And when it comes to the Bible, it is God's truth, which means it is not given to us to change and do whatever we want with. It is simply given to us to believe. There are certain things which God has called good, which we as Christians are certainly encouraged and welcomed by God to embrace. But then there are things which God has told us are bad, which we should certainly avoid for ourselves, but also warn others of their danger. This is not always fun, and it's definitely not always easy. But as Christians, this is what we have been called to do. And children have been too. They need to know this. They need to know what God has done for them. And they need to know what God has told them about life in this world, so that they can know what to take from the world and what to leave for their good, not only in this life, but also in the next. Unlike the world, where we are supposed to glean through what it offers, taking only that which is good for us, the Bible, again, is not a buffet, where we only choose and emphasize those things and those doctrines which seem easiest to us and appeal at the moment. And the creeds of the church remind us of this. Take, for example, the first and second articles of the Apostles' Creed. In the first article, we confess that we believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. This article grates against the current popular notion of the theory of evolution, which fundamentally denies the concept of a creator. And then there is the second article of the Creed, in which we confess the work and person of Christ. Here we confess that for our sake and for our salvation, Christ was conceived and born and lived a sinless life and then died on the cross, and that then he rose from the dead to fulfill the Old Testament scriptures. We would properly identify this as absolutely vital for the Christian faith, but we cannot take the contents of the second article of the creed while ignoring those of the first. This is because they are all connected. They are given to us by the same God, and they are given to us through the same book of divine revelation. So this shows us the importance of holding on to the creeds of the church, and the importance of teaching them, and the Bible on which they are based, to our children. Neither the apostles nor Nicene creeds are themselves God's word. The same goes for all the Lutheran confessions, which serve to distinguish us from other denominations. But all of our confessions are drawn completely from God's Word. They are organized, topical presentations of it, which make it easier for us to learn and understand the faith, and then to share it with others. The children need to know this. We all need to. We all need to be taught every day of our lives that the Bible is not just a story about other people, but because we have been baptized into Christ, and because we have been made part of his death and resurrection by the grace of God, it is also a story about us. God has woven us into it because the Bible is about our spiritual ancestors, through whom God preserved the promise to send the Savior, the Savior whom he did send, and who gave and gave the name Jesus who took all of our sins onto himself and then put himself in our place on the cross. This is the Christian faith. This and everything else which we read in the Bible and in the various creeds which are based on the Bible. So, just as Moses encouraged the people in his time 
to be faithful to people to feed things. Yeah, excuse me, to be faithful to God in keeping His saving truths. So also may we be faithful in keeping these same truths from God on our heart. And may we be faithful in teaching these truths to our children. So that for all of us, the one God who exists may keep us as his people and keep himself as our God. Amen. And may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.